Uh, my name's Kurt Boberg. I'm a staff security researcher at SEMGREP, uh, and I'm going to be talking to y'all about uh, detecting malware in open source dependencies using static analysis. Um, and there are quite a few of you in here, which means some of you may have read the abstract, and so I'm very sorry if this talk is not what you expect. <laughs> uh, also, there is a cup. There are two cups back there with green papers and red papers. If you like the talk, please deposit a green paper. If you don't like the talk, deposit two green papers. Oh, wait, no. Sorry. Deposit a red paper <laughs> in the other cup. Uh, I think we're going to give folks a little bit. I have a lot of content because I can't count, and I thought this was an hour slot. So we're going to see how we do. Uh, I will be available for questions and filtering around afterwards, but I'm going to try and start on time because I think there's a lot of slides in here that I need to get through. All right. Cool. So start off. Yeah, here's my wonderful title slide. Fingerprinting malware behavior with static analysis. Because it turns out malware actually has a restricted set of behaviors. It needs to like do its objectives. And you can use those bottlenecks to reliably look for it in open source dependencies. So who am I? I am a security researcher at SEMGREP. I work on using static analysis to do interesting things in the security space. Uh, before I was at SEMGREP, I built an AppSec program at Chegg, which if you are not familiar with Chegg, it's an ed tech company. And before Chegg, I was AppSec at DocuSign. Before I was security at DocuSign, I was what is now DevOps, so technical operations. I moved bits around and put them on bare metal hardware. So uh, show of hands, how many of you folks are current AppSec practitioners, just like ballpark? Yeah, that makes sense. Y'all busy? Like all day, every day? Yeah, so here I have a non-exhaustive list of all the things you probably do. Like I made this list just off the top of my head of things I used to have to do in a random week. So we're busy. We don't have a whole bunch of time to devote to going and like auditing packages by hand all the time. We could really use some tooling help. So how many of you have been around long enough to have been doing this job in November of 2018? How many of you had a node tech stack in November of 2018? How many of you can guess what package this is? If your answer was flat map stream, you are correct. So uh, I had the misfortune of being an AppSec person in November of 2018, and I had to deal with the aftermath of flat map stream getting found out. And I very rapidly had to go comb through a whole bunch of CI logs, which were not terribly verbose to figure out where we had it. Because like event stream is in like everything. It's in one of the like core node build tools. And so it was, just, it was just like everywhere. So yeah, we didn't have verbose logging, logging. I had functionally no audit capabilities. I spent a lot of time doing this. And there were some folks at the time who published blog posts and yada, yada, yada about like static analysis wouldn't have found this because it wasn't in source and the malicious code was loaded from a file that was in a tarball, and it wasn't even valid JavaScript, so static analysis wouldn't parse in, blah, 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 blah. But like, does anyone remember how it was hidden? Nope. Uh, so it was a fake test artifact in the tarball that wasn't in the source, and then the preloader loaded the contents of that test file like inline decrypted it with a key used from a library name and then it fixed up the JavaScript and wrote it back out to source. So like, yes, technically static analysis didn't find the crypto wallet stealer, but there's some like really suspicious nonsense in there. Like who inline requires crypto? That's insane. Like this is like very very weirdly like trying to be like, yes, I am a totally normal package doing totally normal package things. And that's kind of where the idea for this talk came from is that like malware can hide its like true intent of like, it wants to steal your AWS keys, it wants to steal your crypto wallet, blah, 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 blah. But it still needs to like do stuff and you can still read at least some of the code. 
and you, you can only obfuscate so much of it. So, and like, as an AppSec engineer, you're busy, right? What you need to know, because your, your job is reduce the risk surface of the production application. You need to know, is this package bad? Here's a non-exhaustive list of the things you don't need to know. This is for the like forensics and DFIR people. They can go play with indicators of compromise and TTPs and all that nonsense. For us, this is kind of irrelevant. We just need to know, hey, this package is doing some really suspicious stuff. We should just like not use it. So it turns out you can kind of just read the code to do this most of the time. Like, and it doesn't require compilation or running the code, right? It's source code. It's inert until you like do something with it. So that's one of the things that we can use as defenders to our advantage is like, we, we don't need complicated sandboxes or anything like it. It's all open source software and they have to publish it to like NPM JS. It doesn't do anything until you NPM install it. And until you do that, it's just like an archive. Like it's a tarball, big deal. The other thing is malware has a very specific set of goals, right? It's not like do anything the language can do. Usually they're trying to establish a foothold or exfiltrate data. Those are kind of like the two things malware does <laughs> these days that like has any value to a threat actor, right? And so if you constrain that to, well, it's got to execute arbitrary code and it's got to send data over the network. Those are those are bottlenecks in most programming languages that you can use to go look for behavior, especially if the library you're looking at like doesn't need it. Uh, Crypto is another big one. We'll talk about that later. And again, they need these features. Also, a lot of malware looks like this, or this, or this, or so. Like this guy got clever and like kind of sort of renamed imports. So. Like it's a lot of the commodity stuff, like some of the APT stuff is like really clever. Like solar winds was pretty clever, but most of the commodity nonsense you're going to see is like pie obfuscator nonsense, like on the previous slide. Like that's just like the reality. And most of the traffic is going to be that let's solve for the 80% case and then we'll go fight North Korea. And uh, this is not a new idea. Like as many of you may already be aware like uh, Datadog built some interesting stuff with Semgrep. Uh, the, I think it was an intern project originally, but it, it's called GuardDog. They've done some interesting research with it. Uh, the oldest mention of using static analysis in this case was from a symposium here in DC 20 years ago in, 20, in 2003. So not a new idea. Uh, I'm not the first person to come up here and talk to all of you about this. I will not be the last. And there are also uh, some other folks in the space that are doing interesting stuff, like Phylum, they're here as well too. All right, so what we're gonna kind of abuse here is that malware authors aren't really immune to the Streisand effect. Like, by hiding your behavior, you are telling me something about your behavior, right? Like, normal open source software is open source. Your source code is not a secret. Malware authors are cagey little buggers. They do not want to share their trade secrets with defenders or with other malware authors. Like, as part of this research, I read a lot of the like wasp stealer stuff and man, that guy's so angry. Uh, and you know, lot, lots of infighting and complaining about people stealing their ideas and blah, 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 blah. So, they actually want to obfuscate their code for like reasons beyond evading us. Like they actually don't want their trade secrets stolen by like their competitors. Um, and the benefit to this is like the obfuscation in open source is really high signal. You don't need to in real software. It's one of those uh, only used by adversaries, which was a, a thing that my mentor used to use as like a what should we go look for that's really, really high signal? Like XML external entities. Who still uses XML external entities in like normal XML processing behavior now? Like nobody. You can probably just shim that behavior and go, oh, someone processed external entity. Someone is trying to do tomfoolery in my application. 
The other thing is most package managers handle setup for you. Like you don't have to do a bunch of like bespoke writing bits onto a spinning disk with a magnetized needle kind of like script stuff. Like NPM handles setting up most of the stuff for you. So if you see like really complicated install scripts trying to do things like touch registry keys, that's bad. Like there, there's just, there's so much of this stuff that you don't actually need to do. I saw malware that was like reading and writing to the Chrome extension directory. And I'm like, the only reason this didn't get immediately pulled is because no one was looking for it. Because if you would, you would go look at this and go, hmm, some this node package is trying to write to a Chrome directory and like write extensions into it. Cool. Yeah, that's totally not suspicious at all. The other thing is like invoking a shell, especially platform specific shells is also, hmm. Because again, if you're designing a library that needs a bunch of like extra platform specific setup things to happen that can only be done by PowerShell, you are building your library wrong, especially in like Node or Python or Ruby or any other language that has like a nice interpreter layer around that where like the interpreter kind of manages away all of the native code nonsense that would require that sort of behavior. So if you need to write your own script to do stuff, you are coloring outside the lines. Coloring outside the lines makes you suspicious. So I want to talk about like exfiltration, right? Like malware running on a device needs to send whatever it finds somewhere, right? I'm going to pick specifically on flat map stream again, because it's a really good example for actually a lot of these things, partially because it was sort of sophisticated and checked all the boxes. And also I have personal experience with it and it hurt me deeply emotionally and professionally. So I'm going to hit it back a little bit. So what did flat map stream need? It needed to read wallet data out of the environment and then send it somewhere. Right, so it needed to make a network request. And because it was doing detection evasion, right, they used a couple layers of obfuscation to try and avoid being just like outright found out what is this doing. They needed to read from a file that they knew where it was in the archive. And then they needed to decrypt the data with a key that would reliably work on any system that it was on. So, like, honestly, crypto with static key, bad. But you also don't want to, like, hard code the key because that makes analysis easier. So you have to do something weird, like, I think it actually read, like, the package description from an upstream package as the decryption key. Like, all of this stuff is just, like, why would you ever do that? And the answer is, if you ever ask why would you ever do that, that's really good malware signal. So we should write static analysis rules for it. So functionality requirements. You got to read sensitive data, right? That's like touching environment variables, touching registry keys, looking for sensitive file system paths, like the default Microsoft crypto API archive, system credential stores, cloud data or secret stores, HSMs. Like all of this stuff is like very, very suspicious and you should go, hmm. Uh, the first couple things on this list, like environment vari variables and system credential stores, are much more likely to show up in malware simply because they're more commonly used. Uh, they don't need specialist knowledge. Like, run of the mill malware author is not going to know how to talk to uh, Talus HSM necessarily. And also, they probably don't have the card, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, focus attackers may exhibit more advanced live off the land behavior and attempt to like reuse local credentials that they can find like AWS keys or whatever. So you do kind of need to be worried about that. But again, a lot of the time is like until the industry gets way better at detecting these things fast, we should solve the 80% case and make it harder to do this because then we have more time to go chase the actual hard stuff. So. I'm an attacker, I have this data, I've stolen your crypto wallet, your AWS keys, your, we have somehow extracted a like Kerberos golden ticket or whatever and I need to send it somewhere. I've got to send it over like an HTTP request. This is 
usually what they do because it's easy, like Python requests, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you can do it over a raw socket. You can do it over DNS. You can do it over FTP. There's been some weird kind of interesting research into doing it over web sockets, which I've never actually seen in practice, but is hypothetically doable. And also for some reason, we've, as an industry, kind of not paid as much attention to web sockets in my experience as I would have liked. Like some of the tooling is still not great, but that is neither here nor there. Um, and like, again, the 80% case, unsophisticated attackers are gonna do something dumb. They're gonna do a post to paste bin. Like sophisticated, your like Russian APTs, your Lazarus group, your whatever, are gonna do something novel and hard to detect. They're gonna do it over DNS. They're gonna do it over web sockets. They're gonna do something weird. So, and then like they want to transmit this. Maybe they want, they want to hide what they're transmitting out. That means encryption, right? And libraries that are doing crypto that shouldn't be doing crypto is also really high malware signal. Highly suspicious. All right, so the next thing I want to talk about is code execution, right? If you want to execute code, you either have to somehow execute arbitrary shell or you need to execute a binary. Um, executing a binary in open source stuff is not unheard of, but weird. Like, you, why? It should be like a dependency of your dependency. Like, why does this package have a package binary? Uh, so that's, that's suspicious. It can also be from like live off the land. Um, and that might need like, ex it might need exception handling for like certain things. Like sometimes their thing only works in JScript or something, which I have seen and that is also weird. Or it needs like platform detection. So it's like, I only know how to like drop my binary on Windows. So I need to make sure your Windows, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, so functionality requirements, you have to start a process from a string. Like some, whatever open source thing you're touching has to start a process if it's gonna do code execution. Sometimes they use like native, like native Ruby execution or things like that. Generally not, like as we've noticed from like security, like this room is mostly AppSec practitioners and how many of you have like tried to hire good, talented AppSec people? Show of hands, just curious. Was it easy? Right, because finding people who know security and finding people who know code and do both of those well is actually kind of hard. So a lot of the threat actors are like, I could learn how to like learn Ruby metaprogramming or I can just execute a shell script. And if I am a, you know, cyber, because like criminals and threat actors have Jira boards too. They have KPIs and growth targets and all that nonsense, just like we do. They're going to do the fast, cheap, easy way most of the time. And so, yeah, and you need that static first stage too, right? Like you, this open source thing is going out there and deploying. And then like, if you've got any sort of like, IR sock background, you know that like the first thing that drops is always a loader. It's not like the, the PDF is not dropping a cobalt strike beacon. It's dropping an intermediate stage that is reaching out to whatever the C2 is this week to go pull down their cracked cobalt strike beacon. So you've got to read instructions for future stages from somewhere else, which means you then need to pipe that into a command process. So you can do all the fiddly obfuscation you want, but you need a string and a web request from somewhere to like go tell it what to do. Or it's gonna be hard code and you go, yep, that looks not good. Let's not let it run that. Uh, and again, just to hammer the point home, fiddly obfuscation in open source is bad. Like if you do nothing else, if you have any static analysis tool out there at all, that does any sort of like custom rule writing, just write a super simple rule for like basic base64 code obfuscation. And anytime a developer wants to, hey, can I add this random package? Just like run, does it do weird nonsense with base64 in it? Because that's weird. Yeah, no one needs to randomly decode base64 strings and then pass them to like system or exec. That's just weird. 
And we'll make a passing mention of persistent access here just because it is one of the things malware does. So persistent access might be as simple as embedding functionality somewhere inside the library itself, like SolarWinds was kind of like this. Or uh, another example uh, is there's a whole bunch of forks of this old uh, Facebook chat app that predates the Facebook chat API. And like some guy wrote it, and then there's a whole bunch of Southeast Asian threat groups that just fork it ad nauseum. And the chat app itself is basically a straight fork of the original project, and it like works. But there's always in one of the methods, there's like a side loaded thing that takes all the credentials you put through it and it sends them off somewhere else. Um, system behavior might be pre install scripts. They should like doing things they absolutely shouldn't, like writing reg keys, invoking PowerShell, adding cron jobs or startup items. Just, like, there's, there's all sorts of just. The persistence is like actually kind of obvious. <laughs> like there's there's so many things that like normal software doesn't do. Um, like as I'm sure you've all heard a million times, attackers think in graphs, defenders think in lists. And like that's kind of true because we have our checklist of things we need to go do, but we can use that sort of graph thinking against them because they're like, well, I have this path that I need to get through. And like the bridge to there is through these specific nodes. So now you have a list of nodes and your list brain is like, a list, I love lists. Let's go through the list. So yeah, use that to your advantage. Like attackers have bottlenecks too. Uh, a final note, uh, being sneaky, some malware authors are aware that this behavior exists. Like I'm sure some of them are going to watch the recording of this talk and go, hmm, maybe I shouldn't think about that now. Some of them have already been doing that. But again, let's pick on flat map stream some more. Like they clearly thought about this, right? Their target was a specific open source crypto wallet that they wanted to grab high value wallets out of. So they were like, okay, how do we hide this so it's not obvious? I'm like, well, we're not gonna put it in source code. We're gonna put it in the tarball and we're gonna encrypt it and put it in this other random file. And then we're not even gonna make the unencrypted stuff valid JavaScript. We're gonna make some invalid JavaScript that won't parse on a first pass with static analysis. And then we're gonna do a transform to it and then we're gonna write it back out. But to do that, they had to make the archive different from the source, which in general, you don't have to do this, and we'll talk about this a little bit later. You, in your metadata, if you publish your source, and then like I can just ask you for the archive of the version you're trying to install, and then I can basically go, okay, here's the things that your open source says is in this archive. Here's the list of what's actually in the archive. Are they different? If they are, no, I'm rejecting this package. You can't have it, it's bad. Decrypting a static file, weird, like open source, don't do that. Um, a known but not obvious static key, super suspicious. Rewriting the output of that decrypted file, suspicious. Back into regular JavaScript, again, why? It's like the, like looking at things and going, that's a Rube Goldberg process. Why is it a Rube Goldberg process? Like it could be simple and it's not. Um, I'm, apology if this is a really, can, is this like legible to anyone other than like the front row? All right. Um, so I'm just gonna skip past these cause they're examples of, eh, maybe I can just do, Uh, threw up. Oh, no, there we go. Here is an example of a reverse shell. And it's pretty simple, right? Like, like using really basic, like, data flow taint tracing, we're going to say, hey, if I am reading a PHP built in get or post, I'm gonna add a request label to that. And then under sources, I'm also going to label a socket open. And I'm going to require that that source 
has tainted data flow from my request in it. And then here we have a process open. And we're going to label that. And then our syncs are just, do I ever call write on that socket? Do I ever call read on that socket? I spent a while trying to think of like why you would implement this in like a legitimate open source application. And I came up empty. So if the audience would like to ponder on this for a few minutes and get back to me and think if you can come up with a reason you would ever do this in legitimate open source software, I would love to hear it. All right. Okay. Let's see. Yeah. Uh, I really hope this is not the right. Yeah, that, that was probably. I may have just closed my presentation. Whoopsie. Yep, my bad. Sorry about that. Uh, nope, 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 nope. There we go. Let's go ahead and get back to. Because I did not. Yeah. All right. So there's some examples. Uh, I will make these slides available via the scheduling app later. Uh, but TLDR, um, it turns out that writing static analysis tools for just like very broad hand wavy descriptions of like what you can go look for, not actually that hard. Uh, again, I work at SEMGREP. I love SEMGREP. I find the syntax really, really easy to write. Also. The open source version is free and like perfectly good at this because a lot of the malware behavior is often restricted to one file, which open source SEMgrep is great at. All right, moving on. Uh, let's see how we do that time. Oh, we are doing not great on time. All right, speeding up. Okay, so developer goes pip install widget lib. What happens? All right, so their laptop goes, hello, yes, remote registry. I would like the metadata for widget lib, please. And then the project goes, here you go, and it sends it back a giant blob of XML or JSON. Uh, it turns out package managers don't validate any of that metadata. You can just lie. You can just go out and lie on the internet, and like every package ecosystem will let you. Nobody checks. In 2023, nobody checks. All right. So your client does some version resolution stuff. That actually doesn't matter to us as AppSec people. Like the client doing client things is fine. And we just kind of hand wave that. And so the client decides, ah, based on project requirements, I want version 1.2.3. And so it sends a request to the public package repository. And it goes, here you go, archive. Sometimes it's a zip. Sometimes it's a zip named wheel. Sometimes it's a tarball, so on and so forth. Uh, turns out you can lie about your archive too. Like there, there's nothing that says your archive has to be the same as your source description. So um, there's like, other than like your integrity hash manages the like archive you published, that's fine. What if I told you that it's actually super easy to proxy all these requests and then like do inspections before you send them back to like NPM? So what this looks like is your package manager goes through your proxy, which is like npm.foocorp.com. And before you like just pass through forward that onto npm.js, you, you don't have to host any of these artifacts. You can literally just pass all these requests through. You grab that request and you send it off to a bunch of metadata checks and you go, hey, like, has the author of this package published like anything ever before? Or have they published 50 packages in the last one hour? Or so on and so forth. Or like, do they have a repository attached to this project? Is it a repository attached to another project? There's, there's a bunch of metadata stuff you can do. And there's a bunch of other folks doing this. But it turns out that like, this actually kind of works. And you can pre-flight doing static analysis on the repository that they told you is their project. You can go, OK, maybe I believe you. Maybe that is your repository. I'm just going to go clone it because it's, it's source code. It's, it's harmless, right? You're just cloning it from GitHub. 
and then you run static analysis on it, and then you send that result back to your internal proxy. So when you get the response from the metadata, you get the metadata analysis results. And sometimes you look at the metadata and go, this package is bullshit. And then you just basically go, no, you can't have this package. And you just give it a 500 and NPM throws up. And then the developer doesn't install the bad package. Great, we win. Sometimes the metadata checks don't work. So here's what normal behavior looks like in the thing. So you go, package manager goes, hello, yes, I would like this tarball, please. Request goes to the package. And then, so it comes back and you get a request that's got a tarball in it. And it's in the proxy and the proxy hasn't completed the request yet. So what you do is just, the proxy goes, cool, a tarball. I'm gonna, well, I'm gonna check it for zip slip and compression bombs. And if neither of those things are, because if either of those are true, because you could also do that. You, so if you find zip slip, you find a compression bomb, you just go, nope, you can't have this, 500, and it blows up and it never ends up on the dev laptop. Or it's like, okay, this zip is safe-ish. So you unpack it and then you run static analysis on it because again, we don't trust the source code. And you could do things like, okay, here's the manifest of the zip file. Here's the manifest of the source code. Are they the same? What doesn't match? And then you can have some heuristics around like, okay, like maybe there's like minified JavaScript or maybe there's webpack stuff. Like, don't do that in open source. Like, just let the like end user do all the webpack stuff. But I digress. But this is a really nice little approach to like, you can stick this in front of your developers just like using NPM, like it's transparent to them as long as you can like GPO a config onto their machine. They don't notice, they just go NPM install some bad library and then the registry just goes, no. Okay, so there's at least one person in this audience and I can't see you right now, but I know you're here and I know you're thinking it. You're thinking about intercepting traffic to a remote host that has integrity hashes in it. And you're like, hey, wait a minute, as an attacker, that sounds awesome. I can just get in there and insert my own archive with my own integrity hash and then just serve it to the developer and then I own their machine and I own your company and you're dumb. I know you're out there thinking it and we're gonna talk about that in a second. But first we'll talk about the benefits of this approach because yes, there are some downsides. So having a proxy lets you check that metadata before ever completing the like archive fetch. That's kind of nice and also being able to inspect metadata lets you do things like add policy to metadata. You can be like, thou shalt not install packages that do not have a long history of maintenance. Thou shalt not install packages with only one maintainer. Thou shalt not install packages that are still at pre 1.0 version. There's like, there's a lot of like nice controls in an enterprise environment around doing this. Uh, and then again, for the nth time, archives don't have to match their source. You can use this to make sure that archives that don't match their source don't end up in your environment. Central behavior means central configuration. Set it up once, run everywhere. It also means that CI behavior and dev laptop behavior is the same, which like super underrated, especially if you can GPO this config out to your developers and they don't have to do anything. If you make your developers do extra config stuff, they will be get mad and they will hate you. So you will need a solution for that. And uh, optionally, you can use Darth Vader tactics. Like, okay, I've set up this central proxy. You know what that means? All requests to npmjs.org that are direct from anything in my environment, just get black holed. No requests to npmjs for you. Your developers will hate that too. So I would not recommend it. But if you're in a very tightly controlled environment, you could. So these guys, because I know there's a few of you in this room. I was one of you. So I know you're thinking about how wonderful this is for attackers. And you're right. It turns out an intercepting proxy for all of your open source dependencies is a really great place to be for an attacker. But you can also put this in a DMZ and instrument the crap out of it and make sure that no one ever logs into it. And if anyone ever logs into it, everyone on the security team gets emailed. Like there's, 
There is no 100% perfect security control, but we can build a lot of traps around this. And also, it's catnip. Like, they're going to go straight for it all the time, so you know where you need to concentrate resources. And also, you can put on, like, like honeypots and virtual environments that aren't actually your proxy and all kinds of other. Like, you're the defender. You control the landscape. Abuse that. Like, defend, like attackers should be worried that every time they SSH into a box, they're about to get bounced out of your environment because you caught them. We can do that. Uh, config enforcement, not trivial. Config enforcement is hard, unless you have a really good GPO story or JAMP story or however you manage endpoints. Making sure every developer is running through your custom registry proxy is hard, but you've probably had to solve this for other reasons. So your mileage may vary. And building trust is hard. Like developers would be like, what about uptime? What about I don't trust your weird intermediate proxy thing? How do I know that you're going to serve me good integrity hashes? Blah, 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 blah. You're going to have to have those conversations. They will not be fun. If your developers don't trust you already, you're going to have a bad time. I would not recommend this. Uh, so yeah, like step zero is make sure your developers are your friends. And a collaborative security strategy is always going to be better and more effective anyway. So that's like the pre-talk to this talk. And I'm, sh I'm pretty sure like that's exactly what Tanya's talk was earlier today. So do what Tanya told you to do and then do this. So it turns out that these drawbacks are actually kind of universal because instead of using a like central proxy, you can also use a thick client. Um, like, for example, Socket has a thick client around NPM that, like, when you go Socket NPM install, blah, 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 it goes and talks to the Socket database and goes, is this bad? Do we think this is bad? Is the metadata okay? Blah, 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 blah. No, you can't have it. So you can use the thick client approach. Thick clients are still attacker catnip. Instead of your proxy being the target, now it's wherever Socket serves a binary from or wherever you serve the socket binary from. Like, are you serving it from a central binary repo in your environment? Because I've worked places that do that. They just have like, here's where we store the developer tooling and it's on an SMB share and it's probably got off on it. And then there's scripts that just read all the tools from there and deploy them out to the engineers and everyone is happy. But like, there's no integrity checks on any of those things and you could just drop whatever binary you want and then you win. So you can kind of shell game like where this problem is, but like you can't make it go away. Uh, config, enforce config enforcement is still hard. How do you make sure every dev is using the thick client? You can force them to install it on your machine with GPO or Jamf or blah, blah, but you can't like physically glue your dev's hands to the keyboard and make them type NPM safe. Like, they can just still sit in a coffee shop and go, uh, screw you, security team. I don't want to listen to you. NPM install. You can't tell me what to do. And also, I'm an admin on my machine because I have to be to do my job. So like, you can really only nicely suggest to developers to do things. You can't make them. <laughs> so don't try. Um, for the feds, controlled environments. <laughs> Uh, first pass filter on like internal cache pro proxies for open source dependencies. Uh, I live in an area very close to a military base and I know a lot of contractor folks and I hear them complain at meetups all the time about how long the audit cycle is for new open source dependencies. Uh, my understanding is that it sucks. So you can't use dependency proxy history because like again, the federal government will never, ever, ever ever approve of the security nightmare that is a central dependency proxy. That's not going to happen. But you can use some of these same approaches on those binaries to speed up your audit loop to make it go from months or weeks to days or hours. Because you can use static analysis to crystallize institutional knowledge. If you have someone who's really good at reviewing PHP or really good at reviewing Ruby or really good at reviewing Python, they just take, here's all the things that I look for, static analysis check. Now that person can go on vacation and their process still runs because their knowledge is now in a static analysis rule and not in their head. 
and they can also leave and you don't have to like have nightmares about backfilling them i mean you probably still will have nightmares about backfilling them but that's for other reasons because a significant portion of their code review skill set will be like in a source code repository that you can run in a repeatable way. The other thing is their behavior will be really repeatable. Like human checks are not consistent. Like people have off days when re reviewing code. Uh, computers review code exactly the same every time. So some ways you can do this on the cheap. Uh, you can actually do it for free 99. If you already have a static analysis tool, write some rules. Figure out how open source dependencies are managed in your environment. If you have a mature story around this, you probably have some kind of internal mirror, either for internally managed like UI components for Node or some kind of internal libraries that you don't manage via you know, cloud NPM because you don't want to put your internal IP source code on the internet, like, duh. So you probably already have an internal proxy, maybe, or you're thinking about deploying one. Uh, you can just deploy like static analysis there and unpack your archives and then go scan them. Uh, you can do this for free with SEMgrep if you don't already have a static analysis tool. Like I said, open source SEMgrep, great for this. It's fine. You don't usually need a lot of the like fancy pro inner file features or anything like that. Most malware is going to be little itty bitty snippets in one file. Again, if you're worried about the sort of Lazarus group folks, you have a different problem <laughs> and you should probably not listen to me. But again, if you're worried about the 80%, this will work on the 80%. I also have an open source project that I worked on. Uh, it's called Border Collie. It's basically a Python event-driven uh, file system monitor. And whenever a change happens in a monitor directory, it goes and it looks at it and goes, are you a zip archive? And then it goes, OK, if you're a zip archive, I'm going to check you for bad zip archive things. And if you're not, I'm going to unpack you into a blast directory. And then I'm going to run some grep on you. And then I'm going to, and it was originally built for reverse shells getting dropped in web apps, but like it, it's just semgrep, it just needs rule configs. You can tell it to run whatever rule sets you want. And then it'll do stuff like remediation, like it'll schmod it to like read only so you can go do forensics or whatever. It'll call webhooks so you can go talk to your SOAR platform and send your security team Slack emails and blah, 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 blah. Anyway, there's, there are some tooling options out there, but the TLDR is like a lot of malware is not that complicated. You can find it with static analysis, learn a little bit of static analysis, and then go hunt malware. It'll be awesome. We'll all be more secure. Uh, super, super quick stuff we found. Uh, this one, yeah, uh, package impersonation, exfiltrated stuff, right? Web request to rando domain, reported at 10 p.m., npm pulled it. Example, uh, this one was a, test packer was, ah, this was a security researcher. Technically, proof of concept, like, look, I can publish malicious package to NPM. I don't think this one got pulled. It did not get pulled. Uh, arguably still an active risk. Security researchers are starting to get to be really interesting targets for threat actors. And uh, also, their motivations can change. Like, you have a bad enough run of bug bounty hunting as an independent researcher maybe crime starts looking good when you need to pay rent. I don't know. I've never been there, but I could imagine such a thing. Um, and just to keep it on the level and make sure that all of you out there like see failure from people who are arguably successful, some of it wasn't malicious. Uh, we found a bunch of these things that were from uh, Payoneer, and we reported them, and the user got banished by NPM security team. But I looked at the result and I was like, hmm, and I dug into it a little bit, and it looks like they accidentally published a bunch of internal stuff to public NPM because I found some GitHub actions in their archives that matched GitHub actions from Payoneer's publicly facing stuff. So uh, if you work with the Payoneer folks or know who this was, uh, oops, our bad. <laughs> 
uh, and uh, obviously nothing is perfect. Uh, closing thoughts. Hey, executives are really concerned about malicious dependencies. Sure, I'll get right on that after all of the other stuff I have to do, right? Like there's, we need tools to help us here. So malware hides in just the sheer volume of open source stuff. Like NPM is what, like 500,000 packages or more at this point, like it's a lot. Uh, if you can make visibility tractable, either via automation or other clever trick, like AI's ML, ML, AI is not a thing, ML. ML is getting better at this, but it's still like, it makes stuff up. And in three to five years, ML will be really, really good at this. But for now, it's kind of on us. Um, there's a constraint set of behaviors malware needs, so go look for those. Go look for weird crypto. Go look for weird process invokes. Go look for weird network requests. Uh, static analysis focused on tradecraft makes visibility tractable. Like suddenly, like the, oh no, how do I like read the source of 300,000 packages? You know who's really good at reading a whole lot of text really, really fast? Computers. You just have to tell them what to look for. And it turns out what they need to look for, not that big of a set. Um, and artifact proxies or bastion zones give your static analysis like somewhere to do its job, right? So even if you're not like mandating this, this can be an interesting like DMZ place to go do stuff. And uh, also if you do nothing else, like having a mirror that you can go through like Artifactory, even if it's just passed through, you can do things like ask Artifactory, hey Artifactory, what's new in the past 24 hours? Because now, no matter what your devs do, as long as it's like transparent to them, like your mirror will narc on what they're installing. And then you can go follow up on it and go, hey dev, I see you installed like malware package one, two, three yesterday. No. Uh, yeah, anyway, that's my talk. I think we're basically at time. Uh, I am happy to answer questions if there are questions. And I will answer questions until they tell me to stop talking. Questions? That is the first hand I saw. You're not wrong. I have other thoughts about Web3 so and there. Yeah, and mm, Web3 is its own special beast. And good. But you're right. Crypto becomes less of an obvious indicator if we're starting to do lots of degenerate decentralized app applications that make heavy use of like the EVM. Any other questions or comments? Roast my talk. Pure source, no building required. So the answer is kind of like the engine itself would be running on the source code and you'd have a set of results on the source code and then you'd run it on the contents of an archive and you'd have a set of results on the contents of the archive. Semgrep, doesn't really like reason about paths because that's not what it's designed to do. Like you'd have to build custom tooling around enumerating the contents of a source file and enumerating contents of a zip archive and then going, okay, like are all of these files the same? Do they have the same hashes? So you'd have to do a little bit of extra boilerplate work there. I've done some of it. It's like not trivial, but straightforward. So like it, it it's not hard, but it's also not trivial. Anybody else? Questions? Yes. So I'm going to restate the question to make sure I understand. How does SEMREP? How do we ensure the integrity of our own source code? I think we, like, I am not an SRE at Zemgrep, and I have not been in that space, so I can't definitively answer how we do it. I know we have some kind of uh, binary approval process as we go through, like, publishing to Homebrew and uh, PIP 
and stuff of that source. Uh, the we're working on getting to, or I'm I'm starting to nag the SREs about uh, starting to look at like salsa compliance because we build a lot of that stuff through GitHub Actions, and as long as you turn the right switches on in GitHub Actions, it can actually get to Salsa 4 for build, um, which gives you some, at the very least, audit trail stuff you can publish with the build, if not necessarily like integrity guarantees. Um, I think we do publish the, um, the hashes for releases and things like that, you know, standard, like, open source binary things, like publishing a hash with a release and all that stuff. Um, but I can't authoritatively answer your question at this time. So I will tell you what I know, which is that, and also I would refer you to, like, I think the open source, the, uh, the, the, the open source tool itself has pretty good documentation in the repository itself, I'm sure. The, that would be a good place to go look for more information. Yes? So the rules th in these slides are in GitHub. Uh, the stuff that we've used uh, looking for malware internally, I believe, is not publicly available yet. But I am probably going to be publishing a publicly available version of that rule set this quarter at some point. Because I am way behind on that stuff. I wear a lot of hats at SEMGRAD. I'm very busy. But yes, publicly available versions of rules like this will be coming out because it it doesn't help if people can't use it. And I understand that like I have a lot more SEMGRAP expertise than the average bear, and I need to share that with the rest of y'all. We do have a very strong community. Um, we have a community Slack. I don't remember what it is right now, and the marketing people are going to rake me over the coals for not being able to tell you that off the top of my head. Um, but yeah, there's a community Slack. Uh, there's a, there, the community registry is uh, SEMGRAP rules. And um, there are some malware hunting things in there, I think, maybe. And, like, and again, really easy to contribute as a community member. Like we have a CLA, and that's basically it. Question? Yes. <laughs> the short answer, yes. Uh, so. I, we're still working on tweaking a lot of the rules. Um, so there's a couple things that we thought would be really high signal that ended up being not high signal. Uh, one of them was inline child process and node. And there is a node packer. I don't remember which one it is. But it basically ends up injecting a, an inline child process include with a call to uh, which LDD in like basically every node library that has ever existed. <laughs> so we got a lot of false positives from a rule we thought was going to be very, very high signal. Um, so there's a lot of weird edge cases. Uh, another one that we thought would be better than it was was looking for hex characters. Turns out node developers really like using hex characters uh, for color codes in console output. Very annoying. I don't like it. OK, um, thank you, everyone. Uh, if you want to continue asking me questions, I will be out and about in the hall.